I am so excited to speak here. Like, I'm literally so excited. Like, I've never had the opportunity to speak at Area 41 because I was always sort of running around and trying to find more Club Mate because it was already gone again. So this is, this is great. Um, I'm also super excited because this is a topic that I've been dealing with for the past 13, 14 years professionally and a little bit per, uh, longer when it comes to personal interest. And the longer I sort of live in this space and work in this space, you notice certain changes. You notice how the perception of certain fields changes, new people come into the industry. And when I was walking the conference floor this morning, I re it really struck home with me because there are so many of you that I've known from previous years that I've seen before, but there are so many new faces because there's such a massive influx of new talent into the space. And I think that's amazing. That's super exciting to me especially since the space has grown. Like, I feel like we as an industry has, have grown up a little bit. We diversify maybe a little bit. There is much more to do also. But I also realized that penetration testing, which has been like sort of a household name for a long time, has gotten a bit of a bad rep. So what I want to do together with uh, Mick here is I want to give you a little bit of a mixture of a primer for the people who haven't been in the industry for so long, along also with maybe a little bit of a wake-up call for those of you who have been around longer. I hope there is going to be something for everyone, and um, I hope you can have some questions and answers. Well, at least questions, I guess, in the end. And yeah, let's get going. So this is titled Red Team Stories from the Trenches. Now I'm aware that the terminology is a little bit muddy, uh, essentially because like, where does a penetration test start? Where does it end? What's a security assessment? What is essentially just a NASA scan? We're not going to talk about this today, okay? We're just going to assume that a Red Team assessment is going to be some form of more advanced penetration test where you have a fuller scope, where you actually get to deal with stuff that matters. If your definition varies, feel free to come up to me at the barbecue, kind of sort this out one way or another, I'll find a way. Um, I'll probably just buy you beer. Wait, beer is free, right? Okay, anyway. Um, but yeah, what I want to do and what the objectives of this talk are, I want to clarify the opportunities that you get from doing penetration testing. Um, not just for people who do penetration testing, also for people who are customers to penetration testing companies. I want to show to you what you can get from an engagement, because I think in a lot of cases you are not getting what you could get or even what you should get. I want to also, I mentioned that before, for those of you who are right, like straight out of university, something like that, I want to give you a little bit of a head start, show you what this is all about and like, you know, show you some cool things you can do. That translates also for, to that point here. Uh, we have a workshop area set up just outside where you can try some of the stuff out that we talk about in this talk. So if you want to do that, that would be really cool. And last but not least, I want to illustrate to you some of the stuff that goes way beyond what mo many of us maybe consider the fun part of penetration testing, which is, you know, popping shells, stuff like that. And also a part that is somewhat maybe more important even and can very, be very gratifying if you do it the right way. So why are we presenting this? It's a legitimate question, I guess. Um, Mick here has been a professional pen tester since 2010. And since we sort of restructured our approach to penetration testing, especially for larger corporations, Mick has spent a large part of his life in other people's office buildings, or at least in you know, cars outside of them or you know, in their networks at least. Let's just leave it at that. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Stefan. Many of you probably saw me on that stage before in other capacity. Um, I've been a professional pen tester since 2007. I now run the red team at Skip and um, don't get to camp out in the van so much anymore, but it's still very much fun. Um, I have a personal interest or a community interest in, per, uh, in penetration testing 
as much as a professional one as well. Uh, I did a project with a bunch of friends uh, in 2010, 2011, and four were called the Penetration Testing Execution Standard. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, cool. Um, for those who haven't, check it out. It's essentially our attempt to formalize penetration testing to a point where everybody knows what it's about, what he's getting, what he's supposed to get out of it or not. Um, it has grown from a small hobby project to something that gets referenced in PCI DSS, so we're quite happy about that. And yeah, this talk is not about PTS, but you should really go check it out, it's cool. Anyway, when I was growing up, and I am a kid of the 90s, it's true, um, I loved puzzles. I loved puzzles above everything else. My granddad had like two dozens of them like in a trunk just to keep me busy. And I think that's the epitome of my generation of security professionals. I think the traditional hacker mindset revolves around curiosity, trying to figure out how things work. Starts with traditional puzzles. I personally also really like computers. So I started dealing with like these types of things. I realized that the younger people among you probably don't re realize that shareware existed because everything is software as a service now. But I had so much fun with shareware, I was never going to use just to get rid of like these NAC screens or just to figure out how it worked, why, uh, why it would restrict you and how you could bypass it. And that's what ultimately made me want to get into penetration testing. Like I could get paid to solve riddles and like break into systems and like tell people how I did it and like show off with it, that's amazing. So when I got the opportunity to do just that in 2007, I was delighted. And I still enjoy it to that day, that's why I'm still doing it, that's why I'm giving this talk. And so that attacker mindset, keep that in mind, because I think it's an essential part of what makes a good penetration tester, but there are also some dangers that come with it, and we're going to touch on that a little bit later. Now let's talk about penetration tests, or what a lot of people think about when they are faced with the term penetration test. So usually it's an external assessment because some customer approaches you, they may or may not have done that thing, sort of thing in the past, and they approach you, they're like, hello. We would like to know what a hacker can do to us. And you're like, all right, what's your threat model? They're like, we don't know, but we want you to attack us from the outside. They're like, can we use social engineering? They're like, no, that's out of scope. And they're like, okay, cool. Um, so realism is already out the window. So what do you do? In the end, what you happen to do is like, you know, you get a range from the customer, you scan it, you find active systems, you identify the service, uh, identify the services running on it, you match that with the vulnerabilities, maybe you do some web application uh, security assessment, you find some stuff according to the OWASP list, and then you compile that all in a very long, very boring document, and you hand it to the customer. And you go home with a job well done. Cool. So, that sort of project, that sort of uh, procedure is maybe one of the core reasons why this sentence has popped, out, uh, popped up over the years, over and over again. Penetration testing is dead. And maybe it is, if that on the slide that I just showed you before is what we define as penetration testing because there are a bunch of problems with that type of approach. You access, like, you test from the outside. I mean, that was cool 10, 15 years ago when most of the companies who relied on, on systems running internet facing were running their own systems. Like, there was a time where we dealt with a lot of customers who, you know, had an FTP server, had an SMTP server, ran their own DNS servers, and th this provided some sort of value especially since they usually maintain them, uh, themselves. Nowadays, how many of you work in organizations that run Office 365? Or Google Apps? Or Slack? Right? That's quite a bunch of hands. These things usually get taken out of scope 
because it's bothersome to get permission, it's kind of nasty to sort of deal with the fallout, and you sort of outsource security to them anyway, at least in your own mind, if you're like running operations for a company, that doesn't make sense, right? The classic enumeration of an external test ignores, completely ignores, the most common attack paths that we still see in the wild today. Tragically, most attacks still happen because somebody clicks on some shit they shouldn't click on. It's a reality. And by looking at the DM set, you're essentially looking in the wrong place in a lot of cases. You focus on quantity. You focus on quantity so much, you actually lose a track of context and quality of vulnerabilities you identify. What you end up with, and that translates directly into the report, is a massive list. And usually, when you look at them very closely, you see there are like two or three red items. There's a massive list of yellow items, and there is a more massive list of green items. I don't know how many of you have been on the receiving end of such a report, but if any of you can tell me that you got one of these reports, and you went through every single finding, and you mitigated it, and you mitigated it because it was for the good of your company and not just because you were OCD about the report, I'm going to buy you a beer anywhere in the city where you like, no problem. Because no, none of you has done that, none. And the last part, I talked about it already, this attacker mindset, this wanting to solve puzzles, that's super cool. But it's not necessarily what you need on the receiving end. You don't need somebody to solve a challenge for you. You don't need anybody to prove to you, especially um, prove to you that they can break into your network. If you're working in a defensively oriented infosec position nowadays, you know that somebody can break into your network. It's not about how, it's about when and how fast can we stop it. So the mindset is essential. So we try to kind of address that and guide customers towards a way that we feel is more feasible to them. So we tried to sort of like, like sum that up in this slide here. As I said before, external testing is overrated. So we try to get people to do internal testing. We try them uh, to get them to the point where they say, okay, let's just assume we get preached. First layer of defense is down. Somebody clicked on something, we have an insider threat, we have some disgruntled employee, some employee gets blackmailed, does not matter. Let's just assume there's a hostile client with normal permissions on the network. What happens? How fast can we react to this? We go on from that and we assume the internal compromise and we define a fairly long period of time. This is such a crucial point of discussion in pre-engagement that gets often ignored because of other constraints. Example, we were talking to a customer about two years ago, and they were like, well, so here's what we want to do. We kind of want you to infiltrate our like, internal team and become friends with people so you hear like, what they're talking about, and then we kind of want you to check stuff into the local Git uh, repositories that might be malicious and maybe not, and we want to see if they can notice that. And then from there on, like, you should get like, footholds in the network and move laterally and sort of like, escalate it from there. And it kept going. I was like, so yeah, okay, so what are we looking at like, time-wise? They were like, yeah, probably should be done by the end of the month, right? <laughs> like, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen. Like, if you plan internal pen testing that uh, it goes towards the direction of like full-on red team assessments, you should take time into consideration or at least assume that there will be some more visibility if you push for a faster timeline. If you absolutely have to do some sort of external scan, if you absolutely have to deliver the dreaded port scan, the dreaded like external assessment results. Run Nessus yourself. Don't pay somebody 5,000 bucks or more to run a Nessus scan for you. Take those 5,000 bucks, find somebody in, inside your company who is motivated and eager and pay him to do the OSCP. You'll be much, much happier in the long run. 
But if you need to do like external stuff, like get it done, get it out of the way, move on to stuff that actually makes your security posture better. And when you design like sort of any type of engagement, like think about your threat model. I know it's a big word, a lot of people get very scared when you say the word threat model. It doesn't need to be complicated. But you should know in, inside your organization what your, what your common threat actors are and what risks you are facing. That way you can design the engagement to actually cater to this. That way you can also define objectives for the testers that are not necessarily technical. Reaching domain admin is a meta achievement. Reaching domain admin doesn't mean anything for your organization. What you can do with domain admin means a lot for your organization, but getting there is not really the point. So for the sakes of this presentation, we're going to use such a rogue employee scenario as I just described. And we're going to take it from there and sort of see what we can get. So usually in these engagements, and we have done about eight of them in the past two years, all of them were longer than three months, just for reference maybe to sort of sort this into the right category. And we'll talk about some of the things that we can do or did do. In all cases, we started as a legitimate employee, which is super fun for various reasons, because you get to do the entire HR process of getting into a company, which is super fun in itself, right? Um, the cool thing is, uh, because I've been on stages before, just a little anecdote here, because I've been on stages before, people who run like socks and the like usually know the name. It's essentially also not a very big scene in Switzerland, right? So what you get to do is you get to, do, you get to create fake identities and then you get to go to the HR people and you're going to be like, well, here's my ID, but I actually need you to open this account on this weird fake name. And the reaction you consistently get is like, why? And is this legal? So there's a lot of fun stuff associated with that as well. Once we actually get access to the corporation, we do footprinting uh, using all the resources we have. Mick is going to talk about this in just a second and tell you a little bit more what we use there. Before I hand over to him, I want to just say like the, one of the core reasons people go beyond testing single objects and testing entire organizations is because they want to see where things, where the negative space applies. You don't want to look at service, you don't want to look at clients, you don't want to look at processes isolated. You want to see how these things interact and where they touch upon each other because that's usually where the nasty stuff lies. So I guess I'm going to hand it over to you and yeah, we'll see where we go. As Stefan mentioned before, we are working as a normal employee and so we are allowed to use tools from the company, tools and information. We can get access to wikis, to SharePoint, to documentations and so we have a, a good picture of how the infrastructure is built, where are the security controls, how are the network segments, how is the configuration of Windows servers and we can collect a lot of information just by reading documents on the internet of a company. That's quite useful for the first step for information gathering. And then we go on from there, uh, look for other information we get. Um, there's the, the point with social engineering. Then people say, okay, with social engineering, you get everywhere you want, anytime. So just you go to the water cooler, say, hey, hello, I'm the new guy, how are you? And uh, what's the administrator password, please? But I think in Switzerland, this doesn't work quite that way because Swiss people aren't that open-minded to new people. So you just can't go there and press them. You just stay around the water cooler or hear talks maybe collect some little nitty bits of information and get it to the big picture. Maybe after a few weeks, you get trust of employees and then you can go the social engineering way. But I think in Switzerland and the mentality of Swiss people, you can't just storm in and say, hello, here I am, and I do its nasty things. So it just, you have to be slow and cautious what you are doing. 
And another point here are meeting rooms. Meeting rooms are really, really great for penetration testers because there are a lot of them in a company and you can use them for storing your device. You take your device, go in the morning, early in the morning in the room, leave it there and go away. If someone finds that device, this doesn't mean you did something bad. It doesn't mean or it doesn't leave a trace to you itself. I mean, they fin find a device in a meeting room, but your mission isn't blown because of that. And otherwise, if you are in the room and someone comes and says, hey, there's something funny in the network, you can say, yeah, well, possible deniability, I have my own notebook, and as a bad habit, I plugged in the network. Uh, so I'm, I'm really sorry. So meeting rooms are, are great to hide your tracks. So we are looking in wikis in SharePoint for sensitive information, but that's not that's only the start because we, we search in the network, in the Windows network for open shares. And a quick hint for administrators, if you put a share, a, a dollar at the end of your share, that doesn't mean the penetration tester can't see the share. Only the Windows File Explorer doesn't display the share but every other tool finds that share. So protect your information and don't hide it with a dollar at the end. We are looking for plain text credentials in configuration files, in PowerShell script, in Visual Basic scripts, and mostly we find one or two local administrators on servers. So we can log on on a server, have local admin rights, and with local admin rights, we are able to collect credentials of other locked on users. So we just extract passwords, hashes from other users and use them to hop from the one server to another and gain deeper and deeper into the network until we have enough credentials to reach our goals. We use different um, tools for that, for the lateral movement, uh, usually, we have a combination between Mimikatz to extract the credentials. We use PowerShell or the PowerShell version of Mimikatz to run Mimikatz in the memory and don't leave any traces on disks. Um, and we have remote PowerShell or VMA exec, a Python tool to send a command to a remote server and instruct them to download the PowerShell script from our own device, which is maybe or maybe not in a meeting room, and extract them and give back the credentials of user to us. But sometimes, sometimes when you are in a company which did an assessment before or they have aware people which are looking for plain text credentials, then you have to go to other tactics, to other paths to get your information. And in 2018, many middle attacks in networks still work, and mostly they are undetected. So here one of the great tools is RespondePy, because RespondePy is able to poison network multicast requests and redirect all the clients to your own system, and then you are able to get ch challenge um, random domain uh, hashes, which you are able to crack these hashes. Afterwards, you get them. And it has also an SMB authentication server. So every user which goes to your server, then Windows automatically authenticates him and you get his hash as well. And the nice trick here is just create SEF files put them on globally available shares like a transfer directory, and every user which just open this directory will automatically connect to your box and leave his credentials there. It's really, really useful. But sometimes you have the hash, and then you get the password. But, oh no, the user or the company uses multi-factor authentication. They have smart cards. And of course, the pin code of the smart card is not equal to the password. So you can't directly log in into computers without the smart card or the pin code. But again, we have 
the anti-alarm hash, the anti-hash of the user, and this gives us access to web apps, web apps which don't have multi-factor authentication per default, like Outlook Web Access. Or we can access shares. Or maybe we can access a Citrix portal which streams application to users and go on from there. So without smart cards, we are still deep in the network. We, we can get mails, we can get files, and we can maybe start applications. So we don't need log on directly to a computer when you get all the other information out of the anti-hash password. And sometimes you don't have the possibility to get user accounts, but there are technical accounts in the network as well. And a lot of companies, they once set up an account to run a service, then they set up the service on one or two or more systems, and then they leave it. They don't change the password, because when you change the password of a service account, then something breaks every time. And then you have the trouble to debug to find the right server, so you better leave it alone, you have your password, and you leave it there, don't change the password ever again, and maybe you use not strong passwords, you have a simple password, because you set up the user just for testing a simple password, then you set it all up, and then you don't have the time to change the password. And we can use a technique called Kerberosting, to get Kerberos tickets of service accounts which, are, which use Kerberos authentication to run. So as a normal domain user, we can get a Kerberos ticket of a service account, and from there we can try to crack the password of a service user. And afterwards we have a service user, and most of the time the server user has local admin rights on a server, and then the history repeats itself, we can go to the server, use password credentials for lateral movement until we reach our goals. There are other possibilities to get service accounts. Maybe you have a group policy which creates a scheduled task, or you change the administrator password on all clients with a group policy. I mean, it's not a very wise idea, and Microsoft published a patch two, three years ago about that, because the password is encrypted in those files with a globally known key on the MSDN library. So everybody can decrypt this password stored in group policy preferences files. So just get rid of them, but don't forget to use long, strong, random passwords for your service accounts. And then you hear always, hey, we go in, we have 10 different ways to get domain admin. Domain admin is the, is the key for everything. It's the solution and it's the best thing you can do. But when you did once uh, audit in a network and you get domain admin rights, you can imagine that the Active Directory team will be pissed. And they are really pissed, and they do everything they can, and everything they know to catch you the next time you do some stuff in their network. So the domain controllers will be protected. Active Directory groups with domain admin permissions will be monitored. Maybe they place honey accounts there for you just to light traps. So you better leave domain controllers alone. Maybe you don't go for domain admin. I mean, if you get access to payment server or customer system with normal user accounts. So why do you need domain admin rights? And this is a real world example. We had a project two years ago where we get an, a nice, shiny, new Windows 10 client, and we found out, hey, there's a privilege escalation on this client, which gives us local admin rights. And then we figured out, hey, we can use this local admin uh, rights to extract the password of the local admin, which is the same on all other Windows 10 clients. And there are around 2,000 
Windows 10 clients in the network. So we can use these credentials to connect to each of these clients, run Mimikatz there, extract the password of a logged in user, and go on. And after we did this for two days, we had more than 400 active user accounts. And as you can see, we had accounts from business leaders, from department management, business unit managers, and some accounts of members of the board. So we had access to all sensitive information in that network, just after a quick two-day run of a little tool we programmed specific for that purpose. We used Invoke Mimikatz, the PowerShell version, but built around a tool to give, a just to, to use a host list, and then go from there, read every host, connect to them, run Mimikatz, save the output in a log file, and after then, we had a bunch of log files. And every, everyone here which use Mimikatz knows the log files are big, and it's quite a pain to extract all the nice little passwords out of these files. So we had another tool which just extracted all, us the essential information like the domain, like the username, and the password, or the anti-hash. And so afterwards, we could do everything we wanted in that network. But when you reach the technical goal, your project isn't finished there. Right, that's horrible timing to drink water, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. That's fine. Now that is all fun and games. But I mentioned before that penetration testing shouldn't be about, you know, you running into the company doing all this cool shit and then just like, you know, be like, okay, done. Okay? So raise your hand if you're a defender. You don't have to be afraid, it's fine, <laughs> really. So quite a lot of you. Um, do you think that you could detect, you have the technical capabilities to detect most of that stuff? You. Uh, no, it's difficult. Let's say if you're using local credentials to local messages, it's fine. Typically, this kind of information is not sensitized. You don't have log files in all the app. I'll take that as a no, but generally you could. <laughs> That's the answer you mostly get. Like, none of this stuff is rocket science. Like, I would guess that all of you have heard Mimikatz before, all of you have seen this sort of thing happening before, and it still works. Somebody at the speaker's dinner yesterday asked me, when was the last time you actually used an O-Day in a project? I was like, I don't know, 2009? Something like that? Because you usually don't need them. It's non-essential for to reach the success. But what this is all about in a penetration test, which is by all means not a realistic attack, it is still a simulation, it's all about the attacker-defender interaction. This is where we generate the value. Like, that all before, it's just foreplay. This is how you set up improvement, this is where you set up growth for your company. And here are a couple of things that I want to talk about in regards to that. Before you start, define how you're going to work with your penetration testers that you let inside your company. There are two modes that we generally use. Um, one is concealed, which is the mode where usually there are only two or three people involved on the customer side. Everybody else is completely in the dark. SOC doesn't know a thing. Admins, no clue. You just enter, you start, you try to stay stealthy, and in the end, you sort of like try to figure out what happened. There's the other way, which is open, which is fine. Like, a lot of people are afraid of them. Open means you say from the get-go, we're running to, we're going to run a simulated attack, we're going to see how you can react to this, it's going to happen from then to then, and we're going to do this type of thing. A lot of customers are super afraid of that because they don't trust their own employees, which is weird. Like, if you don't trust your own defenders, what are you still doing? Like, you can close up shop, it doesn't matter anymore. You don't need defenders if you don't trust them. If you do trust your defenders, though, they're not going to fake what's wrong with their defending capabilities. They're probably going to be very realistic about it. They don't have the capacity, they still need to deal with daily business as they do the test. 
and you can still simulate a lot of the things that we did before. And you can have daily touch meetings where you sort of see like, well, we did see that you did this. We didn't see that you did this. This is super interesting. Let's, let's go back to that later, see how we can improve on that. We now advise customers to schedule at least 10 to 40% of the entire engagement for post-engagement interactions and workshops. And I mean, all the stakeholders. I mean, the SOC especially, of course, as a first line of defense in most companies and enterprises. But I also mean the administrators. I also mean client engineering. Really dig into those results, work with those results, and then from that draft report that you probably gave them to sort of deal with like, you know, the sheer facts of what you did, then draft the final report. Um, we got back to that before that. Um, when I said like open test, uh, concealed testing, when you do concealed testing, what you want to do from the get-go is you want to define when you are going to increase noise levels. Because in some scenarios, you do your work at some point, somebody notices something is off in the network, weird, st uh, weird stuff is going on, maybe you triggered something, maybe you access the share you shouldn't have, and then the rat race starts where we sort of try to figure out, like, you know, can we be caught before we actually walk out with data? In a lot of cases, though, or more cases than I would like, personally, the defenders, especially on long-term engagements, don't catch on very soon. In those cases, it's super interesting to increase the noise level of, of your activities in the network. Uh, first, you start off by just increasing you know, the rate of access that you're doing. Maybe you access more shares in a shorter period of time. And you just like, keep going. Go nuts with it. Like In the end, like, we had one project uh, in a sort of a smallish company who was a bit overwhelmed with what we were doing. We ended up doing like a Metasploit Hail Mary attack on like, the server segment. We're like, okay, let's see what triggers. It did actually trigger something, so all's good. <laughs> cool. Um, and the last one is like, when you attack, when you define attack scenarios as a penetration tester, you don't want to have parallelism. Like, it can be very tempting, and it's also a hallmark of real attacks that a lot of stuff can happen at the same time, especially when you're working with more than one tester at the same time but try to keep your activities strictly serialized and for the love of God, timestamp everything you do. Your customer SOC will love you so much more if you can provide them specific, with specific timestamps of that particular privilege escalation that you did on that host that they may not have caught because then they can go back and maybe they'll see, yeah, there was an alert actually for an access and there should be, have been an, another alert that didn't trigger because the timeout was too long, something like that. You can only get that if you have valid information about the timing you have been using. Also, if you serialize it, you can repeat those attacks together with the SOC, and then you can see if improvements have actually been made. As I said before, that you should collaborate with all these parties and sort of craft the final report together uh, as sort of a team, then you get to my core point. Whatever you find in such an engagement, whatever your core findings are, like maybe you need more money, maybe you need more resources, maybe you need to tweak the resources you already have to um, better be able to cope with the demands of your threat situation. Maybe you need to spend those 500 bucks on training, uh, 5,000 bucks on training on somebody. Whatever it is, make sure your report that you get in the end is suitable and you're happy enough with it, and everybody that is involved is happy enough with it, so you can at least bring it to one decision maker within your enterprise. If you do a penetration test, or red team engagement, or any sort of prolonged, expensive, offensive activity, and you don't get it to a decision maker, somebody who actually is in charge of how your company makes business, you are wasting money. Best case, you can get it up to a CEO level, or CTO level at least, and get some actually, actual change uh, going. There is a very significant change in how we find environments that get support from top-level management in their development of their security program versus, um, versus 
environments that are just left with their existing budget, their existing resources. Because as I said before, defenders do generally the best they can with what they have. So if, you, if that's not enough, you need to show that you do need more to do good work. So make it count when you do the sort of impact, uh, uh, the sort of testing. Um, we have some resources that we put together that sort of sums up the stuff that we used uh, in this presentation. Again, it's not rocket science. If you want to get started and like experiment within your own network, you can. Like we're not smarter than you. <laughs> Quite the contrary, I think. But anyway, so you can get started at any point. You can do things in your own network, and I think you should. Thanks so much for listening. If there are any questions, please shoot. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, that was really cool talk to listen to again. It's cool Thank just you. to go back to basics and hear those foundational principles sometimes. Like, yeah, that's exactly what it's about, is just keeping that puzzle mind frame, right? Thank like, you. I love it. Um, do we have any questions? We still have a bit of time before the coffee break now. So do we have any questions? Anyone Thank has? One there. Beautiful. Keeping me fit today. I love it. My Fitbit is loving me today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question. If you uh, actually get a contract and work at, the, at a company, are you doing your job? Are you actually getting a job and working on it? <laughs> or are you just... Uh... Well, funny enough, uh, Mick here was a professional SAP consultant for nine months at the, at the time. <laughs> Can you write this on your resume? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> Great. Anyone else? Thanks. Awesome. So, great presentation. Thanks. Thank um, you. you mentioned two different modes, like a red teaming or a purple teaming approach. Mm -hmm. Um, could you uh, explain a bit more what would you recommend to companies? The purple teaming mm -hmm. or the red teaming approach? It's a really tricky question. Um, I think it depends very heavily on your environment. Like, I got a similar question um, recently and the background of that question was what would you do in our specific environment? And the reason for the question there was um, you know, talk is like stories from the trenches, and more often than not, sadly, there are trenches, in, even in the environments that you go into. And there are cases where a concealed approach is just not feasible for various reasons. Like, if internal audit, for example, starts doing some stuff like that, it will sometimes start massive conflicts between you know, the, the engineering parts of the company, the controlling parts. So in those cases, we usually try to get people to the table and get them like on board very early in the process. And in that case, a proper teaming approach, as you called it, is for me more suitable. But in general, when I just look at results that we had recently, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't prefer one of the other personally. Cool. cool. Any more questions? Yes. I don't love it. Yeah, I'm uh, not sh not sure how, how it is in Switzerland, but um, in case you would do that in Germany and also at our company, then um, then I would expect the privacy guys to go nuts when you're saying, oh, we're accessing that server or that employee machine and it has data from the employees or from the customers on there. How much of a problem is that? Um, it's always a discussion point. Um, we kind of take the liberty of leaving that discussion um, to, the, to the legal teams of the companies we work for because we're not lawyers. We have a lawyer on retainer and we try not to use it because it spends our conference budget. Um, but the, the general, like, I can't really answer a question for you because usually what we do is we write it out in our, like, we, we have a disclaimer in our contract that puts the responsibility on the side of the contracting, like the company that's contracting us. And in the end, what I need is a confirmation from them that we are in the clear. What they do on their side, I assume, like, you know, I, I just believe enough in our customers being professional to actually um, sort of respect the privacy aspects of this. We on our side 
try very, very, very hard to respect the privacy of, of users. Like we really go for business data and we try really to leave everything that might be like in personal folders and stuff like that alone. That's the best we can do really. Great. Final chance for any more questions. Anyone with another question? Beautiful. Uh, are customers not afraid of breaking their productive systems? And has this happened? Well, take that one, I think. sometimes yeah. <laughs> they are afraid and they say, okay, you don't, you're not allowed to touch production system, but then, well, most of the time you have the need to touch them because you, to, to access the goal, you have to go to on, on longer ways or maybe you need to access, how, how you, can you prove that you have access to customer data if you don't are allowed to touch production systems or some, some companies have only accounts in the production system and some few test accounts in other systems. So I think, I think we, we try not to break any stuff and luckily for us, we, we didn't broke any production service in our assessment. So I think we, we can say we are lucky enough to not break stuff and we, we don't force or we, we don't force our hand to do complicated things which maybe destroy a process or so. I think we should not leave the production system alone, but uh, if a customer really, really says, okay, don't touch them, then, then we do that. Cool. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Last one. Yeah, I, mean, I have I three more minutes. I mean, we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you're not ready to have your production systems tested, then you're probably not ready for this kind of testing. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, the thing, like there's a funny anecdote that comes with that, which is uh, in one case, our customer made a really strong point about like, we have an identical test environment with like, you know, um, anonymized data. We have that for exactly that purpose, like, you know, yada, yada, all of that. And what ended up happening is we found quite an easy way into the production server, which would have allowed us to directly pivot into the test server where like the other day, the anonymized data would lay, but we couldn't get for restrictions of the test environment, get directly into the testing server. So imagine the quality of a discussion where you're having, where you're like, well, I'm not actually on the production server, I'm just sort of passing through. So uh, for companies who may not have done red team testing before, at what point can you, is your security uh, policies and, and processes so advanced that you can go from occasionally doing scans and testing to actually doing red, test, red team testing? Is there a point where you can identify that this is the next step? That's a really good question. Um, we usually do like a preliminary talk with people where we just ask them about their security posture, sort of a self-assessment. But it's hard to tell from there because self-assessments are tricky for various reasons. Uh, I think you should know that very well yourself. And um, we've had situations in which we started testing we had reserved multiple weeks of like time span and we had to stop within like the first two days because it was just what well, there was basically no resistance. And that's a point where you should be professional enough to take a step back. I mean, it's super cool to just own the entire network within a couple of days. Like that's fine and all, but it just doesn't make sense to spend that money. Um, I don't think there is a threshold. I think if you were mature, like if your security posture is mature enough that you employ people, multiple people full time, whose job it is to secure your data, your customer data, then I think you should be able to do basic red team style testing. I'm not saying you should go like, you know, nuts and do full scope and everything, but you should be able to like start with that. But for like smaller, medium companies who like have like the one IT guy who runs their like, you know, all their stuff is in charge of like making sure that the, the one CD burner we still have in the company works and also security. Like maybe it's not the right uh, type of testing. Maybe what you need is somebody 
uh, that you can train, or maybe what you need is somebody who comes into your company and helps you secure it, and not somebody who like tries to break your stuff. Cool. Anyone else with a burning question? Otherwise, we can move on to the coffee break. Great. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, please give it up once more to them.